Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I know I haven't gotten to meet all of you yet, but in time, I'll get to know each and every one of you. I promise. Now, I want you to know that I'm a fair division officer, but I'll demand a lot in terms of performance. If you give me your maximum effort and still screw up, I'll be happy in knowing that you at least tried your best. But I don't like quitters or complainers. I'm not an academy or ROTC type. I went through OCS and have spent the last eight years in the Navy learning my way around. Now, this is my second sea tour. Before the Navy, I came from a civilian job, so I know what it's like to be a civilian. My father, though, he was a Navy officer in World War II. I've served one tour of duty aboard the Philly and several tours ashore. I don't care anything about where a person is from or how they grew up. What I do care about is giving a full day's work for a full day's pay and being the best sailor you can. Now, if you do that, I'll be happy. I look forward to working with you, not against you. I don't believe in having my team do anything that I can't do. That's all I have to say for now. Master Chief, go ahead and dismiss the troops. Yes, sir. The tin hut. Dismissed, barked the chief. Several days passed, and not another word was said about the conveyor fiasco. The conveyor, though, did get fixed. The XO continually glared from time to time at the officers at the supply table, but didn't bother Candley or the others. The ship was loaded out and just about ready for deployment from Subic. Over 4,000 pallets of fresh, frozen, chilled, and dry provisions were loaded into the cargo holds and on the main deck. The San Clemente looked like a floating pickup truck on the show of the Beverly Hillbillies, overloaded and trying to make a quick getaway. There wasn't a square inch of deck space remaining to place another cargo pallet. All the cargo holds were completely full, and the weather decks had pallets stacked six deep from the top and five pallets deep from the sides of the gunnels. There was barely an inch of deck space to even walk around all the pallets. All the pallets were covered from top to bottom with cargo netting to keep them intact from falling over the side during rough weather. The crew was tired, but not too tired to go on liberty one last time for some beer and whatever else met their desires. Some of the first-class storekeepers in S1 and S2 division asked Quirk, Twig, and Cantley if they'd like to meet up later on that night at the Pink Pussycat Playboy Club, a rather raunchy sex bar in Subic Bay, near Olangapo. They agreed, after they did a little sightseeing of their own, to drop in on a few of the live sex shows at the Pink Pussycat Playboy Club. For Bob, it was one of the more unusual experiences in his Navy life, since he loved Shelley and was rather a straight-laced kind of guy. Certainly he knew about the raunchier side of the Navy within one year of becoming an officer, and he learned early on that marital fidelity was rare, morality even more rare, and that most sailors didn't care about family values once they were actually on deployment. He always considered he'd done fairly well retaining his own high moral values in the face of other unvirtuous officers and dubious situations. The haunting image he had of hundreds of married men standing in line to get penicillin shots for syphilis on his return cruise from Rota, Spain to Norfolk, aboard the filly, still danced in his head. Bob wondered about the invite to go out with the enlisted. Would it be appropriate? Although fraternization in the service was generally prohibited, it still occurred, and any officer who showed personal favoritism towards any member of the enlisted ranks, regardless of sex, male or female, was guilty of fraternization, as per the UCMJ. This concerned Bob, and so he talked to David about it. Dave Quirk told him in this particular case, no favoritism was being displayed, and it was okay. The few first-class petty officers involved simply wanted to show their respect to their bosses, which they worked for, and because their division officers cared enough about them. Having a few drinks together was not a violation of the UCMJ at least as far as the officers believed. Hey, Bob, I hear you're going to see a live sex show tonight, right? Said Randy Twig as he rounded the passageway corner. Really, Randy, how'd you hear about that? Bob asked. It's true that I do need to get out tonight and see some of those exotic places I've always heard about before we pull out of Subic tomorrow. I have to get my fill of life other than in America. Well, what would your wife say, Bob, if she knew that you were going to see a live sex show? Asked Randy. Well, first, she wouldn't say anything, because she knows me, 
and knows that in every case, all I'm going there for is some eyeball liberty. No hanky-panky, replied Bob. Sure, I would say that too. But since getting my wick wet with some good Filipino pussy over here, all I can say is what a wife or girlfriend doesn't know isn't going to hurt them. Know what I mean there, old buddy? <laughs> Randy laughed. A real crazy laugh. Yo, one sick motherfucker, Randy, said Bob. Hey, if we get to Australia where there's some really good, beautiful Aussie pussy, I'll be in seventh heaven, he squealed. Well, how do you know we're going to Australia, Randy? Oh, the new ops officer, Lieutenant Vogel, showed me the ship's ops sked for the upcoming deployment. Looks pretty lean. Not a lot of ports to visit, except Diego Garcia, Hong Kong and Perth, Australia. It's all about resupply of CTF-73. Well, I've never been to any of those ports, so it should be good. And maybe if I'm lucky, I can get Shelly to fly over and visit me while we're in Australia, Bob said, trying to be hopeful. He asked, well, What about Ensign Waters? Is he coming out with us tonight? Oh, no, no, no. We try not to associate with that little prick. He's usually too busy playing cards with the skipper. Wherever the skipper is, that's where he'll be. Oh, I see, said Bob, shaking his head. The group met later on in the evening just after knockoff ship's work and headed to Subic City near the base. They all caught the jeepney ride into Subic City, riding over potholed, dirty roads neglected by the local Philippine government. They laughed and joked about their miserable experience. Most of all, they wanted to forget their hardships in which they lived by a wild night out in the town. Dave and Randy knew the dangers of the night out in a desolate place like Subic City. It resembled the wild, wild west during the early days of America. Bandits roamed the highways looking for easy picking and were just waiting to rob unsuspecting enlisted and officers roaming the streets. They looked around every corner, waiting to strike the easy prey. Traveling in groups of more than two was a wise and safer thing to do. For all of Bob's naivete about the Philippines, he was smart enough not to venture too far off the beaten path or go into unfamiliar areas. Just about the time the laughing and joking stopped, they arrived at the famous Pink Pussycat Playboy Club. Several young Filipino bar girls hung from windows and yelled at the men as they exited the jeepney. They whistled and howled at the party the entire time they walked up the steps of the club. They strolled into the dark den of sin, wanting to forget their lot in life, if just for a moment. A beaten wooden door, something which might have come from a turn-of-the-century whorehouse, worn beyond belief, was their entranceway into this den of sin. The doorway was dimly lit, like walking into a dark movie theater from the bright sunlight, and you couldn't see more than three feet. Oil lamps radiated a small amount of light in the rear of the club. A gypsy woman was playing in the background as the three were greeted by a bar girl saying, TV boy, will you bring us this time, lovely boy? Oh, just a couple of my buddies. So you think you ladies can handle them and show them a good time at the live sex show in the back room over there? Oh, sure, Sailor Dave, no problem. One of the bar girls glanced toward Bob Cantley and lightly touched his left arm and ran her right hand down his pant leg to his zipper. You want me, big boy? I give you what you want, and you don't have to pay too much. Maybe some sucky fucky would be good for you tonight? I give you good sustenance, too. You liking me? Oh, I always like you, but maybe later, Bob said with a smile. He had no intention of doing any partying like his shipmates. He just wanted to get a taste of what life was like on the other parts of the world. He'd taken care of this situation by purchasing a set of chaplain collar devices to use in such a case as this. Bar girls were mostly Catholic in faith, if they had any at all. They didn't like doing anything to offend the church. The devices were just like the cross set the ship's chaplain wore on his collar. Five bar girls encircled the three officers at their table and jumped on the men's laps as if preparing to give them each a lap dance. They wanted to take the young men to the rear of the bar, where the massage rooms were, so they could earn some money for their families and the bar owner. It was the way they earned their meager living, giving up their bodies daily. Some, no older than 13, was a necessity just to survive in this dirty part of town. Many girls had sex with as much as 10 to 15 different guys a night. Each made about three to five dollars per fuck or two dollars for a blowjob. And sustenance was simply a hand job for a dollar. 
One of the older bar girls jumped on top of Randy Twig's lap, pulled down her top to display her tits to Randy, sticking them directly in his face, and said, Hi, baby. I'm Bambi. You like me, baby? I give you everything you want, baby. Long time. Randy Twig, who always seemed to be the first to wet his wick, was first once again. Yeah, come on, baby, let's go get it on. We'll see you guys in a little while, said Randy as he grabbed the bar girl by the waist and headed to the rear of the bar, known to contain rooms for having sex. Dave ordered a couple of San Miguel Triple X beers. Bob leaned over and asked, So Dave, when are you going to go back with that cute little thing over there? Bob was pointing to the one in the black satin dress with black fishnet stockings. Just as he whispered, a different but very young-looking woman sat in Dave's lap, and another planted her rear right in Bob's lap. Bob was disgusted by the smell of the woman's body. It smelled unclean and of stale beer. With arms and legs rubbing every inch of their bodies and girlish <laughs> giggles abounding, they repeated the familiar bar question to both Bob and Dave. So, you want some fucky sucky sailor boy? We do real nice for you. Give you a good sustenance. Cheap. Make you feel real good, baby. You know I love you so much. Dave moaned and could feel his dick starting to get hard. Yeah, maybe after I finish my beer, honey. Bar girl gave him a wink and a little pinch near his groin. Bob, on the other hand, figured this would be a good time to use the chaplain's collar device he brought along to get the girl sitting on his lap from wanting him too much. He not only didn't want to louse up his marriage with Shelly, but he had no intention of cheating with a whore that might have some STDs. Shelly meant more to him than that, and these girls were just cheap tricks dressed with diseases ready to kill. All fleet personnel had been briefed on a number of bar girls carrying the AIDS virus, as well as multiple other STDs. The number of sailors contracting AIDS in Subic Bay had increased greatly by the time Bob had arrived. He had been briefed about rampant sexual diseases Filipino bar girls carried long before he left PCS from California. Prior to going overseas, he had received medical briefings about what to expect and lots of shots. The news was that more than 50% of the prostitutes in Subic had AIDS. In fact, a Navy Times news article spoke of a Navy doctor who had been court-martialed purely at the bequest of a few irate wives of senior officers stationed on the Subic compound because they felt it was immoral for any American Navy doctor to be treating whores at the expense of the U.S. taxpayers. During that trial, it was disclosed how serious the AIDS epidemic was surrounding the naval base in Olangapo and Subic City. The doctor was found not guilty of his charges. Bob was aware of the seriousness of any action he might take while on his own and realized that moral strength and character were more important than a cheap sexual encounter for a night. Hey, little lady, so uh, what's your name? Bob asked. My name is Suzette, Sailor Joe, but you can call me Susie Q. Well, Susie Q, I don't want to upset you, but I'm not really who you think I am. I'm not like these other officers here I came with. You may believe I'm just like any other Navy guy, but I'm actually a Navy chaplain. You know, a father, a priest, minister. Come on, Sailor Joe. What kind of girl you think I am? I don't believe you a father dressed like this. Prove it to me, you be a chaplain. Okay, Susie Q, but please don't tell anybody about this because I normally don't go out to bars like this except to keep these two friends of mine safe and straight. Here, look at this, he said as he pulled out the chaplain collar device out of his pocket. You've seen this before, haven't you? Immediately, the girl left off Bob's lap at seeing the chaplain's collar device as if she'd seen a devil. In a panic, she said, Why you be here, father? There's no place for you. Why you come here? You make me feel so ashamed of myself. You make me commit sin by sitting on you. She ran away towards the back of the bar with tears streaming down her face. She ran past several other bar girls and the bar manager that wondered what had just happened. She didn't return to the main floor for a bit. Dave said, Boy, Bob, you really know how to treat the ladies, don't you? Well, Dave, you know, the whole situation is pretty sad. These women have no choice but to prostitute themselves to feed their families. It's a lousy situation. I guess a lot worse happens in other places around the world. 
but I didn't come here to theorize about the world. You know, it's what really makes the world tick, Bobby boy. So live it, learn it, and deal with it. At that moment, Randy reappeared from the back of the bar with his arms around Bambi and both her arms draped around his neck, kissing and licking him in his ear with her tongue. Randy shouted, Hey, fellas, I love this fucking hot little mama. Bambi and I are getting married. She's so good to me. You don't know what you're missing. Bob gave a quick glance to Dave that he understood to mean he thought Randy was full of shit. And Bob asked him, So, uh, Randy, what'd you do back there? Have a private dinner? Drunk and seemingly perturbed at Bob's question, Randy replied, What'd you do? Sit out here and beat your meat for the last half hour? Uh, nope, I just sat out here with Dave and enjoyed the ambiance of the bar scene and these lovely young ladies. Dave had already had several beers and was ready to move on to the next bar. It was typical for a night out off the ship to try to hit as many bars as possible. Hey, Bob, did you thank that waitress for the beer she served you? Asked Randy with a slight grin on his face. Dave looked at Bob and said, Yeah, Bob, we forgot to tell you how to properly thank the Filipino girls. If you come back, you'll need to know the lingo. As naive as Bob was about the local language, he accepted what Randy and Dave told him. Dave said, Bob, go ahead and tell the waitress, Mahal kita walang taye, and titi malaki. Yeah, they'll love you for it. It means thank you so much for assisting and helping us. And you're so very pretty. Uh, oh, okay, if you say so. Are you sure that's what that really means? Look, here she comes. Tell her now. When the waitress approached Bob's table, Bob said with a big smile, Titi Malaki and Mahalkita Walangtia. The waitress was shocked by what Bob had just said to her. She reacted by raising her eyebrows and running to the back of the bar. She brought several other waitresses out to Bob's table to point, giggle, and laugh at him. Bob turned to Dave and said, What the fuck did you just tell me to say to her? Ah, just that you loved her excellent service and that you were really glad she served you. No, really. That's what you told her. He replied. But Bob knew he'd committed some kind of error, or worse, and said something a chaplain would not have said to anyone. It wouldn't be until they got outside the bar that he'd actually find out what he really did say. Dave and Bob got up to leave with Randy beckoning them to stay just a little longer. He wanted to make some more time with Bambi. Bambi implored the two officers. Oh, don't take my dandy Randy man away. I love him. I love him, Randy. We get married soon. Randy, I give you all you need. I give you great sustenance all the time. I give you good sex, always, baby. Oh, don't worry, Bambi, he said. I'll be back in a couple of days to pick up where we left off. Bar girls were hanging out the only two windows of the thatched hut bar and waved as they departed the door and headed down the dirt road. The night outside the bar was dark and still filled with smoke from the little huts that were burning wood. The air was high with humidity and smelled of smoke. There was a stillness that fell over the trio as they walked down the dark, deserted dirt road. There were no taxis to be found anywhere. On the way out of the bar, Bob asked, All right, guys, what the hell did you actually have me tell that girl back there in the bar that made them look at me weird? It's just something we do to all our friends as a form of initiation to the Philippines, said Dave. We had you tell that girl that you loved her no shit and that you had a very big dick. <laughs> oh, oh shit, thanks. Really funny, guys. No wonder she and the others looked at me so weird. <laughs> really funny. I'll never be able to go back into that bar and show my face ever again. Uh, Bob, you'll probably never get back to Subic due to our schedule, so don't worry about it, said Dave. Just then, out of the dark of night, a jeepney without any lights on ran them off the side of the road. It came dangerously close, and the near miss was intentional. The group fell into the side of the road, Bob head first, Randy landing on top of Dave in the nearby ditch. But before they could get up and dust themselves off, six young Filipino bandits jumped them with sticks, batons, and machetes, eating and robbing them of everything they had, including their military IDs, wallets, watches, and even jewelry. Randy was beaten badly about the face and the back of the head with a metal baton because he resisted more than the others. Each got hurt trying to defend themselves with their bare hands. 
They pulled themselves together after several minutes in the ditch. And then Bob and Dave helped Randy up. They walked on each side of their stricken comrade and were finally able to hail down a taxi, load their friend into the vehicle, and head towards the base. Without IDs, they were in real trouble trying to prove that they were American sailors in order to get back onto the base and to their ship. When they arrived at the main gate of the Subic Naval Base, right next to Shit River at 2300 hours, they yelled for the Marine sentry on duty to call for an ambulance, and explained that they had been beaten and robbed of their wallets and IDs. The sentry knew this wasn't uncommon for sailors to get into fights, but he just couldn't believe that the three men in front of him were officers and not enlisted. Sirs, if that's really what you are, you'll have to wait here while I call for the provost marshal to come and make a decision to let you on the base without IDs. You know the drill. Yes, we do, said Lieutenant Quirk, showing concern. But we have to get our buddy here, Lieutenant Twig, here to the naval base, fast. He's bleeding heavily from the head. The Marine Guard had the other guard place a call to headquarters. He informed the men of the call. Sir, I've just called the Provost Marshal. His name is Lieutenant Colonel Bechtel, and he'll be here in a minute. I also have an ambulance on the way. You'll have to talk to him and fill out some reports about what happened off base. The olive green drab truck of the Provost appeared with blue lights flaring. Out stepped Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel in charge of security and control for the Subic Bay Naval Base compound. He was dressed in camouflage and walked with a swagger stick in hand. He also remembered Dave Quick from a run-in at the Oak Club previously with their skipper, Captain Manzak. As he approached, they felt not only sore to the bone, but worried about having to explain what happened to the Spine Ripper. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Bechtel, the base provost marshal. The sentry tells me you have no ID on you, and that you were beaten up and that you're Navy officers. What ship you off of? Now the San Clemente, sir. I'm Lieutenant Dave Quirk, and this is Lieutenant Bob Cantley. Our party here needs to get to the base hospital for stitches. Oh, yeah, I remember you, Quirk, from the time you were at the Oak Club with your skipper, Captain Manzak, when he refused to show his ID on demand. Sentry, is an ambulance on the way? Barked the provost. Yes, sir, it's coming now. Oh, okay, sorry you got the shit kicked out of you guys. But that's what happens when you stray off the beaten path in Subic City. So, you guys are stuck on that old rust bucket with that shitbird Manzak, huh? Bechtel said with a big laugh. Yeah, I, I guess so, sir. I see that you remember Captain Manzak, said Dave. Sure do. Your skipper got in some hot water with the Admiral of Comnav Philippines when he drove his government command vehicle on a, into a bollard on the pier, driving drunk and then refused to show his ID after running away from my marine guards that had to chase him and your XO down the pier. He was drunk at the time and nearly ran over my two sentries. Admiral Tooley admonished him and from now on, <laughs> we'll make your CO anchor out his ship in the middle of the bay instead of pierside, just like he did the last time you were here. Of course, you all know that. He hates your skipper so much he won't even allow the ship to be parked at the NSD pier for easy loading. So your skipper has made it hell for you poor supply guys to do your jobs from now on. The Admiral told him that if he ever had any more trouble out of your CO, Manzak's career would be all over and he'd be persona non grata here in Suic Bay, meaning that your ship won't even be allowed in port. Yes, sir, said Dave. I know, I was there. By the way, this guy here is our new cargo officer that has to do all that loading out in the middle of the bay from the barges. Well, like I said, I remember you, Lieutenant Quirk. Yes, sir, I was one of the poor bastards that had to load all our cargo out in the middle of the bay from barges instead of pierside because of Manzac. Trust me, we don't like him either, Colonel. So, uh, Lieutenant Cantley, how do you like your new skipper? Asked the Colonel. Uh, I don't, sir. Well, fellas, I do believe you are who you say you are, so, uh... Come with me and I'll give you a ride to your ship, now that the ambulance has arrived. Sir, don't we have any reports that have to be filled out? Asked Dave. Hey, you guys can stop over by my office tomorrow, pick up the paperwork, and fill it out at your leisure. If your stuff was stolen, that's too damn bad. The Navy's not going to reimburse you, so uh, it's best you don't worry about it. Just chalk it up to experience and learn from it. You can get new ID cards from your own ship's personnel officer. <laughs> said Bechtel, as he let out an incredible laugh at the two. 
Randy, still bleeding, got into the ambulance and drove off in the direction of the hospital, with one of Bechtel's Marines in tow. Well, Dave, said Bob, what an interesting night this has been, huh? If this is any sample of the excitement I'll be privy to during my tour on the San Clemente, I'll really be in for a great journey, won't I? Bob, it's just one of those days. What can I say? When the pair arrived back on board the ship, the XO was waiting at the quarterdeck. He managed to receive news of the robbery and beatings. He thought it was pretty funny, especially because it happened to supply officers. The hospital had called the ship to inform the CDO of the injury to Lieutenant Twig. So you guys can't seem to stay out of trouble, can you? Sneered the XO. Just seems that if it's not one of you pork chops getting into trouble screwing something up, it's screwing up off the ship, isn't it? That's not true, XO. And you don't really know what happened out there on the beach. You aren't there, Cork responded. The San Clemente was getting ready to deploy for the Indian Ocean. There was an air of concern around the docks to get last-minute things done before the ship got underway. For single sailors, it meant taking care of finalizing personal affairs. It meant saying goodbye to local bar girls and maybe getting lucky one last time before setting sail. For the married men, it meant calling the wives back home in Guam or in the States. But for the Supply Corps officers, the enlisted supply members, and the engineering snipes, it meant lots of work with no time off. There'd be barely any time ashore to make even a phone call. Bob made sure that when he and Dave went over to the provost marshal's office, that he'd try to call his wife long distance. Shelley was assigned to the PSD at Naval Station Aganya in Guam. He'd been notified via EasyGram that Shelley had just arrived after leaving her several weeks before. On the main deck of the after cargo bay, the men and women of S2 Cargo Division were assembled for morning quarters. They'd already been briefed about the remaining work schedule by the Master Chief. The POD had already been read by the LPO as they awaited their division officer's final word or wisdom for the day. He walked up to the Master Chief and rendered a professional salute in return, then began his briefing. Bob Cantley said to S2, Folks, we set sail tomorrow morning at 0530 hours. We're going to need each and every one of you to accomplish your mission today without fail. That means everyone must keep their wits about them, stay alert, stay safe, and keep an eye out for one another. It's easy to get injured during major cargo loadouts, and I don't want that. It's easy to get depressed at the thought of a long voyage without seeing your loved ones. I understand that. I miss my wife. Most of all, it's easy to become bitter when we're the only ones working during the last few days, while the other divisions get their fill of liberty. So I promise you, if we as a group get the work done, you'll be on liberty tonight. So let's turn to and do our best today. Lastly, I want all the LPOs to submit their readiness reports to the cargo office on time when we get ready to leave tomorrow morning. I don't want to hold up the captain's setting of the special sea and anchor detail. Master Chief, dismiss the division. Aye, aye, Mr. Kelly. S2 Division, the Tin Hut, dismissed, barked SKCM Brown, and then he asked, Sir, is Mr. Twig going to join us on this cruise, or, or are we going to see without a food service officer, since he got the shit beat out of him last night? Well, can't really say yet, Master Chief. I haven't heard anything before I went to bed, and not since I got up this morning. When Mr. Quirk and I go over to the Provost Marshal's office today to fill out the police reports, we'll stop by the base hospital to find out what's going on. I hope he makes it to the ship before we leave. Otherwise, we'll have to leave without him, and they'll fly him out to Diego Garcia for us. We need good people on this supply side, sir. Sure will miss him if he can't make the cruise. Mr. Twig's a good guy. Little twisted, but still a good man. If you hear anything, Mr. Candley, please let me know. I'll take care of the business down here on the main deck. You gonna make your rounds of the cargo hold, sir? Yes, Mac, I am. I'll begin my rounds in about uh, 30 minutes or so after I grab a cup of coffee from the wardroom. I'll see you later right after lunch once we get back from the provost. We need to make sure everything is firmly secured out on the weather decks in case we run into bad weather. I heard something from Ops about a typhoon coming our way in the South China Sea. Oh, I'll make sure we have all the cargo nets covering everything, sir, and do it once around the ship myself before evening meal. If I find anything out of norm or unsafe, I'll have the first class responsible in his cargo hold to get his people to fix the issue. Other than that, I want as many of these poor hard-working sons of bitches on the beach tonight to blow off some steam. 
We're all a little bit pent up, if you know what I mean, sir. Things are not good, and the guys and gals in this, too, are stressed. Bob and Dave went to the provost's office and filled out the required police and injury information, then headed back to the ship right after lunch. Coming out of the provost's office, they bumped into Lieutenant Commander Deborah Hunter from Nilso. Well, hello, gentlemen. How are things since I last saw you the other day? You're getting underway tomorrow, from what I hear. I also heard that your lieutenant friend, uh, Mr. Twig, got beat up on the beach. Is that true? Well, sadly it is, yes, ma'am. We have to go to the base hospital now and check on him before we set sail. Well, I do hope he feels better. By the way, your skipper just stopped by our office. I had to inform him of the bad news from the Admiral. Now, what bad news was that, ma'am? Asked Quirk. Well, it appears that the Admiral in charge of ComNav Phil has decided to make your skipper and your ship, the San Clemente, persona non grata here in Subic, at least until another commanding officer takes over. Oh, yeah. I heard something like that last night from a Marine Lieutenant Colonel, said Dave. Well, until then, ComNav Phil is never going to let your ship back in portside at NSD ever again. That means any cargo must be loaded by barge out there, in the middle of the harbor. It also means that Liberty will require use of utility boats and pea boats to get ashore. I guess the point is to place a black mark on your skipper in the eyes of all the superiors at CTF-73 and the CNO, Lieutenant Commander Hunter said. With all due respect, Commander, but that fucks us, not the skipper, said Bob. It's not a good thing for us being a cargo ship and having the resupply out in the middle of the harbor, instead of pierside. You know that, right? I do, but I'm really sorry for you guys. But the Admiral wanted to make a point with your skipper, and I think he's done it. Admiral Tooley had your captain sign a paper acknowledging that he understands this kind of a stick-it-to-you kind of thing. If you know what I mean. Wow, I think we're the only ones that got the stick-it-to-you deal. We better get back to the ship, Dave, and tell the crew about this, because... You and I still have to get on the beach one last time before we leave early tomorrow morning. Need one last beer, and there's something you and I need to do before we get underway, said Bob. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, let's blow. Nice seeing you again, Commander Hunter, and thanks so very much for the great news. We're sure the skipper's going to be a real asshole now because of this, once we get underway. I don't envy you guys putting up with Captain Manzac, but please do your best not to get into any trouble so my office doesn't have to do any more paperwork. Oh, we'll be okay. See you later, Commander. At that, Dave and Bob jumped into a base taxi for the base hospital. And once there, discovered Randy Twig had just been discharged and sent back to the ship. They turned around and headed straight back to the San Clemente and found Randy in his stateroom. Bob checked in with his master chief and discovered that Manzac had really gone off the deep end after getting chewed out by the Admiral and came back to the ship and claimed that the ship was listing two to three degrees to port, and that S2 had damn well better fix the fucking problem, or there'd be no liberty at all for S2 personnel on this last night before the ship set sail. SKCM Brown said, Mr. Cadley, the uh, skipper came aboard mad as hell, and then for some crazy reason, he got it up his ass that S2 had personally put a two to three degree list on the ship's port side, due to incorrect weight and balance of the stores that we loaded over the last couple of days. I admit we may have a one degree list, but I think the skipper's just pissed off and making up this shit, period. Oh, don't worry, Mac. I'll go talk to Mr. V, the chief engineer, Chang, to check it out. And if there is a list, I'll get him to simply shift some ballast. That's the standard protocol when you have a list. Yes, sir, you go do that. As Bob entered the engineering office, looking for the Chang just off the main deck, he spied Commander V talking to one of his CPOs. Excuse me, Chang. I was just looking at your list bubble monitor up there on the overhead, and I see that we have a two-degree list to port, sir. Could you shift some ballast in the tanks to counter the list? Bob asked politely. No can do, Mr. Cantley. By direct order of the skipper, he said not to do it. What do you mean, no can do? That you're unwilling to transfer ballast or that you won't? Well, can't and won't. The skipper says jump, you say how high. You've been on board long enough to know that when the skipper orders anyone to do something, you better follow through. Bob was livid. He said, Well, S2 can't shift any more fucking cargo, sir. We're completely full. And cock blocked, port to starboard, and a bath to beam. We've got every fucking inch of forecastle full of cargo, too. 
there's not a single fucking inch of deck space left to shift anything around, either by forklift or by hand. All of our cargo holds are cock-blocked full to the brim, and we can't even get into the hatchways we're so full of cargo. Hey, it's not my fucking problem, Chop. Go see the captain if you don't like it, replied V. Fine, I will. But know this. There's nothing I nor S2 can do, so we'll just have to sail with a list. Candley stormed out of the engineering office onto the main deck, into the sunlight, about to bust a nut. He viewed all of the cargo piled up to four pallets high, with cargo nets covering everything and thought, This fucking CEO and Chang are both fucking idiots. They know damn well once a ship is fully loaded out for unwraps, there's zero that can be done to correct the list without shifting ballast. What a bunch of fucking morons. All of a sudden he thought out loud, Hmm, so the skipper's just fucking with me. And fucking with supply, yet once again like he always does. I'm not going to do anything. In fact, I won't even acknowledge this issue if he calls me up to the bridge and orders me to fix it. All of a sudden the words, Cargo officer, lay to the bridge now. Were called out over the 1MC speakers by the bosun's mate of the watch. Oh, fuck, here we go, thought Cantley, repeating his mantra. Just stay calm. Don't give the skipper any reason to kick me off the ship just yet. And just shake your head as if to acknowledge that you understand what he's going to tell me. As Lieutenant Candley entered the doorway to the port bridge wing, he noticed the skipper's location. He was sitting in his captain's chair. He approached, saying, Cargo reporting is ordered, skipper. I know you know we have a fucking list on the port side, Mr. Cantley, and you and your men are supposed to be working to correct it. So here's what you're going to tell your people. No one, I mean no one, is going ashore for any last-minute liberty until this fucking list on my ship is corrected. Is that clear, cargo officer? Captain, may I speak bluntly with you? Sure, just be careful what you say. It might be your last day on my ship. Sir, you know the ship is fully loaded out and that no cargo can be shifted, and even so, a ship can sail perfectly with a slight list. Even a cruise ship fully loaded out would sail with a list, if not for having the Chang shift ballast in the fuel tanks to correct it. So why do we just have the Chang simply shift the ballast? Bob already knew what the answer would be. Manzak replied, because I said you and your crew were to fix the list. Are you hard of hearing or just too dumb to understand what I just told you, Lieutenant? No, sir, I understand. But there is an easy way to correct this by simply having a Chang shift some ballast. God damn it, Mr. Cantley. You're really starting to piss me off. But, sir, it's really not fair to my people when the rest of the ship has last-minute liberty on their last day in port. It will take all night. Please, sir, have a heart. Don't make me repeat myself once more, Mr. Cantley. Better turn to and get working on the list. Oh, by the way, the XO and I have an appointment on the beach at 1600 hours. And when I get back around 2200 hours, this fucking list had better be corrected, or it's your ass, mister. Understand? Bob thought to himself, it's better to bite my tongue right now. So he then said, Yes, sir, it'll be done as best as I possibly can do to fix it. Knowing that he was intentionally lying straight faced to the skipper, He'd worked out his plan of attack in his head as to how to handle the situation. He had no intention of doing a damn thing about the fucking list. It was just going to make the skipper and XO think that S2 was working on the problem when they left the ship at 1600 hours. He knew both the skipper and XO would return to the ship rip-roaring drunk. He also knew that they'd go straight to bed and get up just before setting the sea and anchor detail at 0530 hours. By then, it would be too late to kick the cargo officer off the ship, and the ship had orders from ComNav Phil and CTF-73 to get underway for the I.O., Indian Ocean. Since Lieutenant Cantley knew their itinerary, he asked the bosun on the bridge to have all members of S-2 Division assemble on the after-cargo deck. This made Manzak think Bob Cantley was really going to work on the unsolvable ship's list problem, and that the skipper was in full control, but he wasn't. The bosun on the bridge blew his whistle and said over the 1MC, Now hear this, now hear this. All S2 cargo personnel lay to the after cargo deck for a briefing by the cargo officer. The skipper looked at Cantley and smiled, thinking he'd finally worn Cantley down. Bob met up with Mac walking back towards the after cargo bay and said, Mac, step into the cargo office for a second before we go meet with S2. Sure, sir. So what's up? 
You seem funny, like something's going on. Mac, in a nutshell, we have a two-degree list to the port. The skipper is demanding S2 fix it or else no liberty for anyone in S2. Now, before you even say what I know you'd say, let me tell you this. First, I already asked Chang to shift the ballast, and he pretty much told me, via the skipper's words, to go fuck myself. Manzac is refusing to let any of our personnel go ashore until the list of this fucking ship is corrected. Now, I already met with him on the bridge, so uh, here's my plan, and listen up. Bob began to detail his plan to Mac. Everyone has to cooperate, especially our guys. Mr. Twig's back from the hospital, is okay, and said he'll be standing watch as the OOD, from 1700 till midnight, along with his chief, MSC Bossa. These are guys we can trust to do what we ask. Even though the skipper has restricted all S2 personnel to the ship, until the list is corrected, what I'm going to do is let half of the crew go ashore for two hours, right after 1600, to drink some beer and whatever at the enlisted club, and then report back and then let the other half go ashore. This way, it'll appear that our people are working on fixing the problem by shifting the cargo around, while all the while, they'll be only moving cargo from one pallet to another on the main deck slowly. It'll give the appearance that S2 is working to fix the list. Mind you, I pulled this idea purely out of my ass. Something like you might have seen watching Mikhail's Navy. Sir, don't you think you'll get caught doing this? Asked Mac with a smile. Well, it's possible, but it's also possible if S2 doesn't get some liberty that there'll be a mutiny. So don't worry, Mac. I'll work it all out. Have faith. Okay, Mr. Candley, sounds like you got a plan. But our asses will be in a big-ass sling if we get caught. Okay, let's go talk to the troops now and brief them on our diversion plan. SKCM Brown and Mr. Cantley approached the men and women milling around in the after-cargo bay. And Mac shouted, S2, attend, hut! At a smart interval, dress right, dress. Ready, front. At ease. They're all yours, Mr. Cantley. With a thoroughly disgusted look on his face, he began to speak. Folks, I've got some good news and some bad news for you. All compliments of Captain Manzat. First, you've all worked your asses off during this import period of loading cargo, and in my opinion, have done a splendid job. So bravo Zulu to all of you. I'm going to start with the bad news first. You're all restricted to the ship, and there'll be no liberty at all until the two-degree list that's on the ship's port side is corrected. At that, everyone without exception began moaning and groaning and getting upset at how unfair this treatment was by the CEO directed at S2 Division. So. Oh, come on. Stop, stop, stop. Please, just stop. Now, for the good news. Or at least the best I can give you right now. It's my intention to disobey the skipper. And I'm going to do so with your help. I'm going to let half of you off the ship for two hours as soon as the CO and XO depart the ship. Then, when the first group returns, the rest of S2 will go ashore. I have to limit you to two hours per group in order to get you ashore and back with some beer and whatever else you do before the skipper and XO return at 2200 hours. Now I know it's not what you're planning, but it's the only way I can be fair to S2, since the skipper has effectively said that nobody can hit the beach. Oh. I'm putting my ass on the line here for all of you, so don't fuck me over, okay? What we're going to do is like what Commander Mikhail did in Mikhail's Navy. Some of you may be too young to know who Commander Mikhail was on TV. Anyway, it's also my intent to make it look like S2 is simply working to fix the list by moving cargo around on the main deck, while in reality, all you'll be doing is moving cargo from one spot back and forth with another. It'll all be faked. You'll get to go ashore like everyone else, but with one big exception. While everyone else will be going off base, I must have you all promise to stay on base at the enlisted club or the Navy Exchange so you can get taxis back to the ship easily. You can't do that off base. Now I want the first group to be fair to the last group going ashore, and I want you all back on the ship before the skipper and XO return at 2200 hours. Is that understood, S2? S2 Division replied in agreement. Okay, so who's going to go ashore first, sir? Asked SK-1 White, the LPO for cargo hold number one. White, I'll leave that up to the Master Chief here to come up with a list and inform everybody. In the meantime, get to work making it look like S2 is shifting cargo around on the main deck, 
so the engineer and skipper think that we're working on the list. Mac, they're all yours. You're in charge. Let the games begin. Sure hope you know what you're doing there, sir. This could all backfire on S2, said Mac. With the task accomplished, Bob Cantley headed down to the stock control office to talk to Dave Quirk. SK-1 Janine Birmingham was sitting behind the typewriter when she looked up. Looking for Mr. Quirk, sir? I am. He's in his stateroom. Can you give him a call and let him know I'm on my way to see him? Yes, sir. Bob headed to officer's country and knocked on Dave's cabin door. Dave opened it and said, Hey, Bob, what's up? What is up, buddy, is that you and I have one last very important task to go ashore and do something I thought that will just warm your heart, Dave. The skipper and XO just pissed me off so bad, it caused me to have an explosive creative idea. We're going to go back to that pink pussycat club and see if we can get that bar girl there to write some personal letters in her own handwriting and put some perfume and lipstick on those letters and say that we dictate to them. We're going to make up some stories and send home to the XO's wife about Richard and how he's been whoring around while in Subic. A little dictation from us, along with some perfume and lipstick on the letters, will go a long way in taking care of that fucking asshole. So my thinking is this, Dave. What if we had Richard's wife thinking he was fucking around on her the whole time he was deployed and got one of these girls pregnant? That would really make his wife think that he loved this bar girl that he got pregnant, right? But wouldn't that be a wonderful payback to him for all the shit he pulled on us? It may get Richard's wife so upset at him for fooling around on her while he was in the Philippines that she'll write him back, call him, or even leave his ass. We, in the meantime, will have this asshole so upset and emotional that it'll get him off of our backs. Get my drift? What a wild and crazy and purely evil idea, Bob. So who's going to dictate these letters? Dave asked as he laughed at the whole crazy idea. We both will. It'll be fun. We'll pay like a hundred bucks to, say, Randy's girl, Bambi, or whomever else we can get to write them in their own girlish handwriting. We'll have them mail each letter at the rate of one every three weeks or so until they're done. It'll make his wife steaming mad. By the time she gets the second letter, she'll be even more pissed. And by the time she gets the third or final, <laughs> she might just even leave the SOB. It'll make the whole thing look real, stretching it out over time. And just think what putting lipstick and perfume on the letters will make her think. Come on, the letters will be mailed to the XO's home address in Guam at the officer's housing. I already have his home address, which I got off the PN's computer. It'll seem like it's a real relationship. I figured it'll take us about an hour or so to do this and get back to the ship. There'll be no way of tracing this back to us. It's gotta work. You're fucking insane. But you're also a creative motherfucker, too. I like that. Imagine, fucking a fucking asshole like Askew. My hat's off to you, Bob. I'd never have thought of anything that evil. Come on, let's get going as soon as they leave the ship. I'll grab some stationery and envelopes. Later, dude, I'm going back to the main deck to check on things and then going back to my room to refresh before you and I hit the beach. Okay, later. Back on the main deck, all the so-called make work used to make the skipper and EXO believe cargo division was working on shifting the cargo was going like clockwork. Mac was standing around with a coffee cup in his hand like most CPOs, and the skipper was able to look down on the main deck from the bridge wing and see what appeared to be cargo being moved back and forth. He was too stupid to figure out that nothing was really happening. It wasn't really being moved anywhere, just back and forth and back and forth, like on a movie set with extras. The skipper was clueless. All of a sudden, the bosun's mate of the watch called out over the 1MC. Van Clemente, now departing. Then came... XO departing. Okay, the skipper's now departed for the club. Bob thought to himself. It's time to meet up with Dave at the quarterdeck and get ashore to do our dirty little deed. As they met at the quarterdeck, Dave asked, Hey, you got everything we need? Yeah, and I've got some money. You got any extra? We need about a hundred bucks. Oh, don't worry, I got lots of money. All right, let's go get her done and get back quickly, said Bob. At the Pink Playboy Pussycat Club, Dave asked the manager, Hey, can you send Bambi over to our table? We wanted to do something for us, and uh, we'll pay her and give you some money. No problem, gentlemen. I see you here many times before, Mr. Dave. You are a good customer at Pink Pussycat. Anything for you and your friends. Bambi give you good service, too, I hope. 
Oh, I have no doubt she will, replied Dave. We'll be right over there in that corner. In a minute, Bambi, the girl who was falling all over Randy the previous night, approached. You boys want me? You want some sucky fucky? I gave you good sustenance to both of you, same time. No, Bambi, thanks, but we just want you to do a simple, easy job for us. That'll earn you a lot of money. $100 to be exact. But first, you have to promise to do it for us, said Bob. We want to tell you what to write and have you simply write down what we tell you to write. Let the envelopes, address it, and then mail each envelope about every three weeks until they're all gone. They'll be numbered one, two, three, and four. And all you have to do is remember to mail them without fail once our ship leaves port. You think you can do that for us? Asked Dave. Okay, I do that for you, boys. You write down exactly what I tell you as best as you can in your own words using this paper and pen, said Bob with a grin. Okay. Bambi replied with a curious look on her face. Having never been asked to do anything except give blowjobs, lap dances, or fuck in the back of the lounge. First you give me the money, okay? Okay, here's your hundred dollar bill, as Bob handed her the money, and here's a twenty for your manager. I'll speak slowly so you can write or print. Ready? Ready, pretty boy. Bob first had Bambi address each envelope with Richard and Shirley's home address so it would be in her own handwriting. He then began dictating the letters to Bambi. The process took about 40 minutes. The following is an example of what they had Bambi write down. All four letters sounded similar, except the last two, where she indicated that she was having his baby. My dearest Richard, I hope you remember me, your Bambi girl. I miss you so much. I love our time together since we met last time you and your ship come to Sube. I'm so happy to see you again. And also last night, before you pull out of me again, you make me feel like no other ever have before. You make love so good to me, so last so long and hard and deep in me. I really love you, Richard, and you love me like you say you do. Most sailors just want sex past, but you love me like good and chill. I love the things you buy me, such good gifts. Especially the ring you buy me for what you say is friendship, but what I know is love. I want you back soon inside me. Please come in me soon. I will always love you, Richard, and know how much you love me, because you say you do. I write you soon, love. Bye, your Bambi girl. The other three letters that followed were much worse, sexier, and talked more about her pregnancy. Although time didn't permit any more letters before Dave and Bob had to get back to the ship, they had hoped they could trust Bambi to do the right thing with the money and that she would get them mailed as requested. Dave gave her some extra cash to lick them, seal each with a kiss of lipstick, put some perfume and stamps on them at the post office in Alangapo. Bambi promised Bob and Dave that she'd do as asked, even though she didn't really understand why they were asking her to do it. Only time will tell if the XO's mood aboard ship would change drastically before they got back home to Guam. That would be their sign that the letters worked. Now, it was just a wait-and-see game to see if this would have any impact. As they left, they told Bambi that Randy had been beaten up the night before, but that he was okay, and the reason why he didn't come with them was that Randy was standing officer of the deck watch at the moment. Bambi said, You tell my Randy boy I love him and want him to come see me soon, okay? We will, Bambi. And just remember to mail those letters, okay? Now you be a good girl and don't do anything we wouldn't do said Dave as the pair were leaving the club. Oh, you boys so funny. That's why I like you. See you next time in O-City, sailor boys. Dave and Bob returned to the ship, laughing most of the way back. Once they got to the Subic Naval Base gate, they showed their IDs, did their salutes to the Marine guards, and headed back. On board, they checked in with Randy, who was standing OOD at the quarterdeck. Lucky for them and the crew of S-2, the captain and the XO had not yet returned. It was just about 2,100 hours, with an hour still to spare. They informed Randy they saw Bambi and that she was still madly in love with him. And they also thanked Randy for covering for his crew, letting them off the ship even though they weren't supposed to go ashore. Randy, like nearly everyone else in the supply department, was a team player and kept each other's back with the exception of Ensign Waters and Tony Shapiro. Bob was sweating bullets wondering if his crew members would all make it back as promised, 
before the skipper in the XO. He located Mac on the main deck and was told that since they had gone ashore, literally nobody had bothered to check on what S2 was up to since the captain and XO left. He told him that he'd seen the Chang go ashore with the XO and Captain 2. The list was still as it was when they left. The only other senior officers that remained on board were the assistant supo, deck, and the ops officer. Bob crossed his fingers and took a chance his plan would not be discovered. It wasn't. It was the norm for everyone outside of the supply department, including the skipper, XO and Chang, and Ensign Waters, to all go over to the Oak Club at Cubby Point to get rip-roaring drunk the night before getting underway. Bob told Mac for S2 to knock off the make work and have everyone get some sleep. Bob stopped by the quarterdeck to tell Randy that he was heading to his stateroom and to call him if anything came up, should the CO or XO notice that the ship still had a list. Randy said, Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you that you have a surprise waiting for you in your stateroom. What surprise? Oh, you'll see when you get there said Randy with a big smirk on his face. Bob was so tired and weary, he turned and just headed up the ladder well to his stateroom. His legs ached, back strained, and head was pounding from the stress of going up and down ladders, into cargo holds, and going to the club and back so fast. His head was spinning trying to get things accomplished all last minute before the ship departed. As he edged slowly towards Officer Berthing, where he thought he'd find peace and quiet in his rack, he was about to get a huge surprise. He walked slowly, unbuttoning his khaki shirt as he neared his stateroom door. In the gray painted sterile passageway marked 02-135-2 Lima. It was the ship's locator designation for his stateroom location. Leaning on his gray metal stateroom door, he turned it slowly until he hears the door make a click. Surprise was evident by the shock on his face when he discovered a civilian in his stateroom. A roommate? Who the hell is this guy? He thought to himself. And then he asked, Just who are you and what the fuck are you doing in my stateroom? Well, I guess you and I are going to be roommates to this cruise to the I.O., replied the civilian. You're going to be my roommate? Bob asked bewilderedly. Yeah, I'm Charlie Jones. This is where Mr. Askew told me I was to stay. I'm the ship's new pace instructor. I came aboard, I guess, while you were out. You know, I'm the guy that teaches basic English, math, reading, and other college courses for the enlisted personnel while on deployment. Yeah, I know what a pace instructor is, but sorry, fella. I'm Lieutenant Bob Cantley. You gotta excuse me, Bob said apologetically. I didn't think I'd be having a roommate on this cruise, and I certainly didn't think that this ship was big enough to warrant a pace instructor. But what the hell? The upper bunk is yours. I sleep in the lower one. Bob showed Charlie where he could put his belongings that were lying on the deck in two bags. He then asked Charlie to have a seat. Bob wasn't going to hit his rack to catch a quick shut-eye without first breaking in his new roommate on some basic stateroom protocol in officer's country. Bob began to express concerns about living together in the same room with a civilian. Charlie, I want you to know that I have to live on this ship for the next two years. You, on the other hand, will only be here for just four months. Then you'll be gone. So, here are the rules we're both going to live by while we're roommates. Bob proceeded to inform his new roommate of the rules. First, I don't care what you do or where you go, so long as you respect my privacy as I'll respect yours. Lights are something that really piss me off, along with noise when I'm trying to sleep. I get enough light and noise being outside all day, but what I don't get enough of is sleep. So when I'm in my stateroom, I sleep because I work 18 hours a day, every day, every month. So if you open this stateroom door and see that I'm sleeping, don't you even turn on the overhead lights and wake me up. Because I assure you, it will not end well for you. Silence is golden around here too. I like it that way. If I'm sleeping or working on paperwork, don't play a stereo unless you're wearing headphones. And even then, don't wake me. I'll respect you in the same way. Keep this room neat and clean for the weekly zone inspections by the XO, too. Other than that, Charlie, not much else bothers me. I'll try to be your friend and hope we can get along during your short stay here. If you want, you can share my little refrigerator over there in the corner. Oh, cool, said Charlie. Can I keep beer in it? Uh, no, no alcohol is permitted. These quarters are very tight, and living aboard ship isn't any fun. 
although you might think it's glamorous having never been on a Navy ship before. It's even less fun when you have to share your only tiny bit of privacy. Understand? Hey, believe me, Lieutenant, I really do understand. When the Navy contracted with my university for me to teach on board, they told me I'd be on a ship with my own private room. <laughs> I guess I already know I can't believe everything I'm told by the Navy. Oh, you learn fast, Charlie. So with that, I'm tired. I've been up all day loading stores and need some rest. So if you don't mind, as soon as you get your stuff stored, I'm going to sleep. Okay, Lieutenant, I'll try to be quiet. Oh, and one last thing. See that little light within the desk there? You have a desk light just like I do. It'll keep the light low in the room and it won't bother me. So use it if you need to see. Oh, okay, thanks. Good night. Sorry I shocked you. Charlie left the stateroom for a bit and Bob went to sleep in his rack. He knew he had to get up early in the morning since the San Clemente would be getting underway at 0530 hours from Subic for her long four-month deployment with CTF-73. The skipper had left the ship so mad at being told he was persona non grata at Subic by Admiral Tooley that he went overboard drinking more than he usually did at the O-Club. Instead of returning to the ship at 2200 hours, which was normal, the group got back at midnight, more drunk than ever, and barely able to walk up the accommodation ladder on their own. Randy was still the OOD when the gang of four returned. Although the OOD crisply saluted each officer, not one was able to return a proper salute to the OOD. When the OOD saw the group stumble out of the ship's van and onto the pier, he had the bosun's mate ring the ship's bell to indicate the captain was returning back on board. He had to wait patiently for each crew member to comply with regulation by rendering a salute to the ship's ensign and the OOD. Normally, each crew member, whether officer or enlisted, would say to the OOD, I report my return, permission to come aboard, at which the OOD would normally say, permission granted. That didn't happen. Instead, the XO was helping prop up the skipper, said, Get out of my fucking way. The captain's back aboard. Randy just raised his eyebrows and shook his head, as if to indicate compliance. This is pretty much how things operated since Manzac took command of the San Clemente. At that, Randy called Bob in his stateroom and told him not to worry. The skipper noticed nothing, as he was drunk as a skunk. Hey, Bob, not only did the skipper and XO not ask about S2 or the list on the ship, they were so falling down drunk that they all went to their staterooms to go to bed. The captain has to be up in just four hours to set the scene anchor detail, and he'll be in a very bad mood with a hangover. Well, it seems like a plan work, Randy. The ship still has a two-degree list on it. No cargo got shifted, and my crew got their liberty, although limited. Hey, Randy, did all my guys make it back aboard? Uh, yeah, they did, including the new supply officer, Commander Wiggins. He just reported. It seems he reported on board right after you and Dave left the ship. As for me, I'm not so fortunate with S5. Uh, what do you mean by that, Randy? Well, it seems that one of my first-class mess specialists, MS-1 Raffinen, is AWOL. He was supposed to be back at 2300 hours. He's a guy the skipper had restricted to the ship from time to time for fucking up the skipper's meals. The skipper thought he did it on purpose, but, you know, of course he didn't. His wife just had a baby here in Subic, and the skipper took his security card away as punishment, so he couldn't go ashore. In essence, he was illegally restricted to the ship by the skipper and unable to go see his newborn child. He wasn't even allowed to be at his wife's delivery at Subic Hospital while we were here. He's been freaking out ever since. So he begged me to let him go see his wife and new baby, even though he was restricted by the skipper. Now, I broke the skipper's rules by letting him off the brow, and my ass is now on the line with the skipper when he founds out tomorrow once we're underway. Woe is me. I just may very well be the next officer who kicked off the ship for letting this happen. Anyway, there's nothing I can do at this point except make notes in the OOD log and put myself on report, and of course go to bed. You see what you got yourself into by coming to this ship? Yeah, night Randy. Thanks for your help, and uh, I'm really sorry that your guy let you down. MSSN and Bishop and another mess specialist were still in the wardroom. Bob asked if they'd be offended if they watched porn. They indicated that they wouldn't since they'd be leaving as soon as the movie started. The room was relatively quiet by movie hour. The wardroom had been cleaned and was now deserted. 
The passageways were empty except for a stray officer or enlisted person walking to one of the heads nearby. Even seeing someone in the passageways was remote after 2200 hours. The ship's bridge and CIC were the only places still occupied by personnel on watch. The ship's chaplain was just about to give his nightly prayer. He'd give his usual uninspiring prayer that would ignite the crew into slumber or laughter, depending upon one's point of view and one's condition. The bosun's mate of the watch said, Now stand by for evening prayer. Then Lieutenant Trainer spoke. Let us pray. Dear Lord, today has been another long day for the men and women of the San Clement. Tensions have run high, and as usual, everyone pulled their weight and did a great and truly professional job, which is praise to the Master, our Lord, our God. But along with the stress of the day, there are times when people, just because people are human, do and say things that might best have been left unsaid. God sees and hears all that we say and do. If you feel you're one of those that did something wrong or had a hard day today, then bow your head and repeat after me, the Lord's Prayer. As I say, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. The night ended with the two supply officers paying their respects to the female mess specialist in the wardroom, which respected both Dave and Bob. They left and said good night. They had always received the respect deserved as any person should have from two officers, which wasn't true of many of the other male officers aboard. And Bishop had come to look up to Bob Campbell, she liked Dave Quirk, too, but not the way she liked Bob. She had developed a personal crush on Bob and didn't really know why. He caused her to have a special feeling, a feeling a woman only gets when next to someone which enthralls the heart and excites her every thought. He treated her kindly with the few words he spoke. Anne thought he was a cute, nice, and intelligent 28-year-old guy. Bob was the kind of guy she wished she could find for herself and she knew probably never would. Bob had no way of knowing she felt anything like she did towards him. He only knew what his thoughts were, and they were on his wife, Shelly, now back in Guam. The officers sent the wardroom staff off to their berthing areas while they watched one of the porn films, and then went to bed themselves. As days passed, the crew learned that they'd be pulling into Hong Kong for their first port visit after the unrep with the George Schultz battle group. Ops had received a new ship schedule from CTF-73. The captain would make a big deal of the port visit during one of his rare 1MC announcements. Captain Manzak wasn't much for personal appearances around the ship. He did that stealthily at night. He wasn't great for making special announcements to the crew to let them know he was thinking about them. Usually the only time he made any announcements was when he was totally pissed off at something. He had a bad habit of showing up unexpectedly at moments most would not prefer. And he never had a nice thing to say to anyone. He usually just sneered. Bob remembered his second night aboard the San Clemente when Captain Manzak had discovered Bob and Dave working in the supply office at about 23.30 hours, long after the crew had gone to sleep. Bob and Dave were busy going over some stock transactions of the day and were designing a plexiglass board for use in unreps, like the one recently completed. The skipper stood silently in the doorway of the supply office until the two officers noticed that he was standing there. Dave noticed first and was a little startled. The new experience was intimidating for Bob, who was rarely scared by anyone. The captain appeared like a demon, scrutinizing the pair with cold, dark, evil eyes, and asked, so What are you two men doing here in this office so late? Well, just working on supply matters, Captain, replied Dave. Bob was a little too surprised to know what to say at the moment. Well, what exactly are you working on? asked the spine ripper. SWAD PS inventory codes, Captain, for coding documents that we can properly process all transactions, said Dave. You want to see what I'm talking about? David knew that this would turn the CO off because he didn't understand anything related to supply or ADP. He was only interested in engineering and combat. Supply was a turnoff to him. All he cared about was that the food was served and people were paid, and the ships received what they ordered. No, you just continue what you're doing. Carry on, then. Before Bob could glance back at the doorway, the captain had vanished into the night. As Bob felt like he was in a trance, he seemed to remember that fateful second day when he had just come aboard. After regaining his awareness and a feeling of being so taxed from the events of the unrep, he headed straight to his rack. Charlie was sound asleep already. 
It was now nearly 0100 hours the next day. Bob flipped on the red light in his room so as not to wake Charlie. Bob stumbled into bed and didn't even bother to undress. The stench of the long day's work remained in his clothes, and he got sucked into his bedsheets. The next morning, just after quarters and the reading of the plan of the day, Mr. Cantley was questioned by a crew member regarding the new ship's port call schedule. It didn't take long for news to spread through the ship about Hong Kong. How the hell did you folks find out so quickly? asked Bob, surprised at how quickly the news traveled. I only found out last night before hitting the rack. He indicated his humor of what rumor control had started by laughing, and the crew laughed along with him. As far as I know, folks, it sounds true, but uh, just remember one thing. Promises are made to be broken, and plans are made to be changed by the CO at any time. I personally wouldn't count on it until the day we actually pull into Hong Kong. Everyone broke for work and began cleaning up their storerooms and worked a half day, which is what usually took place right after a heavy week of work. Late in the afternoon before evening meal, the CEO made his announcement over the one MC. Stand by for a message from the captain. This is your captain speaking. Two screws turning and burning, ladies and gents. You all did a good job during the unrep yesterday, except for one or two people, and they know who they are. You proved yourselves to be worthy. Keep up the good work. I expect no less at all times, since you all contributed to a successful unrep, making me look good. I have some good news to report to you today. We'll be pulling into Hong Kong in just about three days of some R&R. At this time, I'll advise you of one thing. I want no fuck-ups on the beach. When we get there, enjoy yourselves, but don't come back to the ship drunk or out of uniform. If you do, I'll bust you. Let me repeat that. I want no incidents, or else you'll learn what sloof means. I have two favorite handles. One is sloof, the other is spine ripper. You don't want to be on the receiving end of either. Have a good time and be back on board on time. I plan on getting underway from Hong Kong on time and heading for the I.O. and Diego Garcia shortly after our visit. I'm putting the chaplain in charge of the beach detachment and advanced beach party. Anyone desiring information on the visit can contact chaplain trainer for info. Sloof out. On his way up to his stateroom, Bob met the ship's chaplain in the passageway and asked, did you hear what the captain just said? Sure he did. Just what exactly is sloof? Asked the chaplain. Well, funny you should ask. I thought everyone knew what that meant in the Navy. It's an acronym I learned about on my first ship, the Philly. So what does it mean? Well, it stands for short little ugly fucker. <laughs> oh, man. He can be that at times, can't he? Replied Trainer. Well, it's more than that. If anyone steps out of line, he'll turn into a short little ugly fucker for real just like he's been on me since the day I reported. Oh, okay. Thanks for the information, Bob. See you later. The next two days were filled with great anticipation of pulling into a wonderful Liberty port. Sadly, the amount of work ahead for the crew of S2 was even greater because everyone in the supply soon realized that as the ship pulled out of Hong Kong, they'd have another major unrep to perform. They had to get the cargo pallets ready before pulling into Hong Kong. In addition to picking up cargo while the San Clemente plowed the South China Sea for Hong Kong, the CO also required the crew to perform casualty, general quarters, and even a man overboard drill for the upcoming operational readiness exercise. The fleet training unit based out of Subic Naval Base would observe the exercise and grade the captain's efforts as to how his crew was prepared. Captain Manzak's past record of operational performance was anything but stellar. He was not a great ship's captain. He wasn't good at navigation, and generally was pretty piss poor when he came to setting anchor. Yet, as the CEO of two fighter squadrons during his career, he shined, which was why he was given a deep draft tour on an AFS in the first place. It was just another rung on the ladder to making flag rank for those who excelled and didn't make waves. Manzak made lots of waves, and yet the Spine Ripper also managed to slip through the nets that certain seniors cast for him every single time he fucked up. Life on a Navy ship is not easy for anyone, and it sure is no luxurious cruise like on the love boat. The San Clemente was more of a floating prison painted gray with big white letters on the bow. The big social problem for all was that as sailors, you cannot escape from those whom you work with because you live together 24-7. All crew members eat, work, shit, and sleep together in close proximity, not necessarily in that order. 
For females, it meant bunking 40 women together in a room no larger than 25 by 60 feet square, with only one head having two shitters. The men had it much better, though. They had one shitter for every 20 men per head. Another social problem the skipper didn't want to have to deal with was that some of the straight females were bitterly complaining about the lesbians having open and notorious sex in bunks in direct view of their straight female counterparts. The enlisted men didn't have these problems. The few male homosexuals which were assigned to the ship remained silent and kept their love affairs secret. They didn't flaunt their homosexuality in the face of other men. So for straight females like MSSN and Bishop, it was disturbing being so young and having to endure such awful living conditions. Anne Bishop, a new reportee, who'd been aboard for a while, was forced to watch two lesbians making love to each other at night, five feet away from her rack, for the first two weeks after she reported aboard. One was her upper bunkmate, Seaman Jean Arno. A year earlier, Seaman Arno had been raped by a male sailor in the cargo hold, while the rest of the crew had gone to chow. She'd been grabbed from behind and blindfolded before she knew what was happening to her. She reported the rape to the corpsman on board and to Dr. Mann, but they didn't believe her. She made up wild stories before and had a reputation of hollering wolf. Ann Bishop and Seaman Arno would never be friends. They came from entirely different worlds. Ann was smart enough to know that if she or any other straight female informed about the sex going on in the female birthing compartment, that the bull dykes of the ship would beat them up or when they hit the beach for liberty. They were known to cut up their underwear and bras that made life pretty miserable for straight females. One time, Ann Bishop made the mistake of reporting it to her division officer, Randy Twig. When Twig asked the female divisional LPO to intervene, things got nasty for Ann. One of the bull dykes in S4 pinned her up against the lockers and told her that if she made any more trouble for the lesbians, She'd either get the shit beaten out of her on the beach, or she might even come up missing at sea. Needless to say, Anne learned to live with it. It was uncomfortable having to endure a different way of life from what she'd known back home. She knew nothing of such behavior before joining the Navy. Life in the Navy, though, was an eye-opener, and her innocence was soon gone. And so Anne would simply put hearing protectors on her ears and close her eyes to blank out what she didn't want to hear or see laying in her rack. Word had passed around the ship during previous months concerning the lesbian affair Seaman Jean Arno had with another female. Seaman Arno had come from a broken home and joined the Navy to escape her abusive father. She was tormented while in high school and felt the Navy would provide her with an escape. But the male sailors made lewd remarks about her every time any female crew members were nearby. Few straight females felt sorry for Arno when she was raped because of what they had to endure, and yet they were concerned that if the male crew members would rape her, they might also be sexually assaulted by them too. Sexual harassment by men was common on the San Clemente, and most males looked the other way when it happened. Being an officer was much better than being an enlisted in that sense, in that officers didn't have to sleep with so many other people. S2 Division's male birthing compartment had 30 men sleeping in one compartment, and 10 females in the S2 female compartment. Bob only had to bunk with one other person, his bunkmate, Charlie Jones, a pace instructor. But having any privacy on ship was nearly impossible. Bob loved the Navy, but felt like a prisoner. There was no relaxation, no escape, just work. He got some sleep when it was possible to get it. Bob, Dave, nor Randy could escape the unnecessary pressures which boiled from within. Tension twisted everywhere on board, and it started right at the very top. The hatred demonstrated by the CO and XO towards the supply officers and the enlisted members kept them on their toes. It lit a fire in their bellies. This feeling was common along with the rest of the crew members, but even more so with Bob and David. As the pair stood in the morning sunlight among the storekeepers, routinely going about their daily routines, they barely knew what was in store for them for the remainder of the four-month deployment. Bob's encounters with the captain and XO from the first day he reported had made him realize he'd walked right into a career-ending event. Dave hated his situation in life, even more than Bob did. He was unmarried, worked too hard, and felt unappreciated for all his efforts, and cleaning up the mess left by man. 
who was now gone to tour the Naval Postgraduate School. It didn't seem fair, but life hadn't always been this way for Dave. And until now, Bob had a pretty good career. Yet through it all, both Bob and Dave believed they could weather any storm which might blow in their direction. But the storm that lay ahead was just the beginning, and it would grow far worse. Well, Dave, we successfully completed our first major unrep of the cruise and are doing pretty good at pulling stock for the next one just after we leave Hong Kong. But do you really think we're really going to get any liberty in Hong Kong if the CO has his way? Well, I hope so, but don't know. Look at the shit he tried to pull on S2 in Subic. Yeah, I know. Anyway, I'm going to go check out the Navy contracting office while we're in Hong Kong. I hear it's a pretty good billet to get assigned to and, uh, and a great duty station for a lot of reasons. <laughs> really? Why? Well, it's a good location. Lots of things to see and do. Lots of girls. And the Navy gives you $3,500 a month for living expenses. I can hobnob with the rich folks at the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. And from what I hear about the club, they've got some pretty friendly young American naval officers. Sometimes the socialites bring their rich daughters there to dance and mingle. I might get to meet and marry one. Oh, that sounds good, Dave, but, uh, but didn't you tell me once that you wanted to marry a Chinese girl? Yeah, sure did. There's lots of them in Hong Kong. Problem is, their real hardcore Chinese families don't want their daughters getting involved with anyone that's not Chinese and not from a wealthy family. There are always exceptions, though. You see, Bob, I want to marry a Chinese girl that's subservient to me. You know, bring me my paper in the morning, feed me, bring me my shoes, and not ask a lot of questions. American girls are just too demanding. And besides, once you marry them and have a kid, they no longer want to have sex with you. They also want to get out of the marriage if things don't go their way and take you to the cleaners. American women are just spoiled. Chinese girls and their families don't like divorce. Too bad you're already married, Bob. This could be a really great port for you to meet some really good-looking Chinese gals with class. Not those bimbos that Randy hooked up with back in Subic. Nah, I'm just fine like I am, Dave. I'm happily married to Shelley, and I think you're making a big mistake by thinking about foreigners. You know, there's an awful lot of great true blue American girls out there, Dave. Well, Bob, at least you got to visit a great port city. There's nothing quite like it in the entire world. We were here just last year for about a week and had some great R&R in this Liberty Port. Sadly, though, we had a different and much easier skipper than our current asshole, the Spine Ripper. They were both enthusiastic about the port visit, but unhappy about how the CO and XO might derail their Liberty plans. A possibility existed for all work and no play, given the climate on the San Clemente. From the day they left port in Subic Bay, there had been nothing but stress and a lot of work. As the routine continued for the remaining time, there was little interference from the captain or the XO. The cargo crew completed pulling all the materials for transfer in unrep number two. Cargo pallets began to line the main deck of the ship once again. It took up space on deck from the forecastle to the stern. Few realized what day it was because of the work that was so intense, working seven days a week. Sundays had always seemed to be easier for some reason. Maybe it was an inherent human clock. Maybe it was because some attended church services, taking time off from normal work. Sunday service took precedence in the morning, with turn two later in the day. It was the day before the ship was set to anchor in Hong Kong at 11.30 hours. The waters of the South China Sea were glassy and calm. Sunlight bounced off the water like a mirror, and the heat and humidity of the sea wore our body down like a hard workout. All of a sudden, the calm of the Sabbath was broken, when the sound of rapid gunfire was heard deep within the skin of the ship. Deep down in cargo hold number two, Bob Cantley was making his rounds, looking for trash, battle lanterns that were out of commission, and possible two kilo forms to write up for maintenance or repair. Then he heard the repeated crack of thunder that sounded like machine guns going off. And then, dead silence. Then the same sound would start all over again. Bob couldn't understand what could be making such a racket on a Sunday morning, just after church services. He was in the deep, dark bowels of the ship. As he grasped the ladder handle and completed stepping out of the ladder well, the sunlight temporarily blinded him. He rubbed his eyes to get them into focus. As he looked out into the morning horizon, he couldn't see anything at first. The ocean was like a plane of glass, and the sun nearly blinded him. He couldn't see where the noise had come from, so he walked over to MM2 Robert E. Lee one of the hardest-working black machinist mates working under Chief Warrant Officer Barketing. 
Robert E. Lee was working on the hydraulic fluid line next to the outer bulkhead on the starboard side just behind frame 40. What was all that noise about, Robert E.? Sure is a sad sight, Mr. Cantley. Well, what do you mean, Robert E.? Well, those bastards up there on the bridge wing, they're shooting those whales. That's what I mean. What? Asked Bob in shock. Where are the whales? Over there, sir. See them? No, all I see is a big orange 55-gallon oil drum in the water. I look right next to it, sir. To the left, about 10 yards away. There. See those black things with sprays of water coming out the water? There are the whales. See? Oh, yeah, I do now. Fuck. These are sperm whales. Just then, the crack of thunder began again, with the sounds of even more gunfire. And the sound stopped again. Bob couldn't believe what he was seeing. As he moved closer under the bridge wing on the starboard side of the ship, large plumes of water were bouncing off the surface of the ocean waters next to the orange drums, just like in the movies when machine gun fire would spray the water. He thought to himself there was no way this could be real. It must be a dream. It wasn't. What are those crazy fuckers up there doing there on the bridge? Asked Bob as he yelled, pointing upwards at the bridge wing. The same as they always done before, replied Robert E. Lee. What do you mean, same as before? Now you're new here, Mr. Cantley. Those boys go hunting all the time. Before this, it was goonie birds. Before that, gulls. Then seals. Now sperm whales. <laughs> God's creatures. It makes you kind of sick, don't it, sir? Bob paused, and then he bolted forward out from under the cover of the cargo bay doors by unrep station one to be in full view of the bridge wing where the shooter stood. As he looked up at the bridge wing, he saw the captain, XO, first lieutenant, and even lieutenant trainer, the chaplain, standing on the bridge wing. Was this for real? Unbelieving, he yelled up to the bridge where they stood and said, What the fuck are you all doing? Are you fucking nuts? Can't you see that you're shooting at? Stop it! You're shooting at endangered species! The officers on the bridge wing stood motionless as Bob hollered at them. His words had little impact and only served as an annoyance. Bob realized that nothing he said would do any good. Then he yelled at the chaplain, saying, Chaplain Trainer, you call yourself a man of God? Well, that's pure bullshit, and you're a worthless piece of shit, and I can assure you that the chief of chaplains would like to know about this. Trainer stood next to the XO and just shrugged his shoulders with a facial expression that said, eh, There's nothing he could do. He's just there to observe the shooting. Bob thought to himself, What a fucking asshole this prick is. The least he could do is not show support by leaving their side and not being near such an abomination. A Baptist minister at that. In total frustration and disgust, Lieutenant Cantley briskly walked to the supply office. When he reached it, he found Chief Kayabyab with Quirk and Twig. <sighs> you can't imagine what's going on up on the main deck, Bob said short of breath. They're fucking shooting at sperm whales. Who's shooting at the whales? Dave stood speechless. He knew full well who was shooting. The Spine Ripper, that's who. Randy, you always ask such dumbass questions. Haven't you been aboard long enough to know that? No shit, Sherlock. I know it's the skipper. But who else is up there? <sighs> the captain, exo, ops boss, first lieutenant, and believe it or not, the chaplain, exclaimed Bob. The chaplain? Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, I heard the shooting when I was down in cargo hold two. Went up to see what the noise was about, and once I got out under the bridge wing, I looked up and saw every one of those bastards, including Trainer, standing there as the CO and XO took turns taking pot shots at a pot of sperm whales, swimming around a 55-gallon painted orange can that was thrown in the water by deck department. They were using M16s. I guess they may have initially been just taking target practice at the drum, but a pot of whales were in the area, ended up only about 30 feet from those drums, investigating what they were. They should have immediately stopped firing, but instead they kept on. And then the CO and XO gave their M16s to the op boss and the first lieutenant so they could shoot them too and maybe kill them. Worse, I watched Trainer just stand there next to them and do nothing. Not a goddamn thing. And he calls himself a man of God. What a fucking asshole he is. Quirk said, Yeah, Bob, he's on board to give us moral inspiration. You gotta remember that. God's watching over all of us. Well, that kind of inspiration we don't need. Hey, Bob, said Dave. Why don't you get some pictures or a video of them doing that before they stop? Hey, that's a good idea. Bob ran up to his stateroom to get his video camera. Charlie was in the room and asked why he was in such a rush. He stopped to tell Charlie. Don't have a lot of time to talk, Charlie. They're shooting a sperm whales out there. And I've got to get some footage of the bastards breaking federal law. What they're doing is a crime. 
Hey, who's shooting whales? Gotta go now, Charlie, Bob said as he ran out of the stateroom to take a video. By the time Bob got to the outer skin of the ship, there was no more gunfire. He ran up to the signal bridge one level above the bridge wing to see if he could observe anything and get a better view. The entire pot of eight whales and four calves were pretty much gone from the surface. Damn, he thought. As he walked into the signal shack, SM-1 Callahan greeted him. You up here to take some videos, Mr. Cantley? Thought I could. Was hoping to, but it looks like everything's over with now. Not everything. Look over there. You see that orange 55-gallon drum? There's a dead baby whale floating over there near it, along with its mother, said SM-1 Callahan, as he shook his head in disgust. I guess the others sank to the bottom of the sea by now. Bob turned on the camera and clicked off some footage. The dead calf and mother floating with a trail of red blood on the ocean surface. He saw shark fins on the surface starting to circle, and some large whale sharks began to swim near the carcasses too. He knew it wouldn't do him any good without seeing the officers who did it on film. It would, however, back up his claim that the incident happened. In case he was asked, Hey Callahan, I'll bet you've seen a lot of things in the time you've been on this ship, haven't you? Stated Cantley with the VHS camera aiming at him. I sure have, sir. Does this kind of thing happen a lot? Bob asked on camera. Hey, yep, it's happened several times since I've been here. We just do what we can to live one day at a time. Nobody wants to piss the captain off. He likes to go on what he refers to as a safari every now and then. Killing things like seals, sharks, birds. Sure likes his M16. Safari? Yes, sir, if you can call it that. Oh, thanks, Callahan. That's all I need. Uh, sir, what are you going to do with that tape? I really don't want to be on that tape like that, sir. I don't want to get into trouble from the skipper. Oh, don't worry. I don't plan on doing anything. Bob hung around the signal shack a while longer to view the open ocean and relieve some of the stress he was feeling. It always seemed that looking at the ocean, whether standing on a beach or walking with his wife, or on the deck of a ship calmed him. SM-1 Callahan said he needed to run down to Ops and lock up the shack. Bob left and returned to his stateroom. It was almost dinner time anyway. That night in the commander's stateroom during reports, fireworks exploded. Good evening, gentlemen, said Commander Wiggins. I hope we all had a pleasant day. As we're pulling into Hong Kong tomorrow, we set the special sea and anchor detail at 0530 hours. Uh, Dave, what do you have for us tonight? Uh, nothing much, Commander. Just that Lieutenant Jones' assistant came to my office and told me that my folks wouldn't get any more supplies issued from the paint locker until I give him more Optar funds. First off, Commander, he's overspent his quarterly allotment ahead of any of the other departments. Secondly, Warren Officer Barketing used the phrase with me that if I wanted to play what he called little fuck-fuck games with him, he'd show me just how easily it would be to get fucked in return. And then I told him he could take his issue up with you. Uh, yeah, I know, Dave. I've already had a chat with Barketing. He came in here bitching about you earlier today. Okay, and what did you tell him, sir? I said that we'd see what we could do to find some more funds for Deck Department if they could show me that they really needed it. Oh, shit, Commander. Do you just let Deck walk all over us because you want to make the points with Jones and the Skipper? Dave asked bitterly. Listen here, David. I do what I have to to try and make peace with him because he has such an ear with the Captain. I do not have to give you reasons for what I do. Do you understand? Furthermore, you work for me. Got it? You can question me behind closed doors, but never in this forum. Got it? 